Hey everybody, I am Ryan Doyle, this is the Verdure Table, and in this video we are continuing our walkthrough of Menace Under Otari, the great little adventure inside the wonderful Pathfinder 2nd Edition Beginner Box. This is part of a playlist where we have already covered the first, like, third of the dungeon, as well as some information about important NPCs around Otari, and planting some story seeds for what can happen after this adventure is over and the characters level up, so while well, you can absolutely jump in in the middle of this if you've already read the Game Master's Guide, especially I would recommend circling back to our first video on the beginner's box so you don't miss all the advice we've laid out for new and experienced game masters prepping this adventure. Now, when you are running a game, you don't have complete control over where and when the session starts and stops. You have influence, and during the last hour or so of game night, I'll start looking for good beats to serve as like an end point, or even better, a cliffhanger to keep the players looking forward to the next time we're all getting together. When you are scripting videos, you have a little more control over things though. That's why I decided the introduction of the kobolds in room seven is a great place to like stop and start a new one. It's also likely to be about the point where if you're bringing new players into the hobby, you're gonna start to establish a bit more of a rhythm. Things will go a little bit faster. We really took our time with those first few rooms to demonstrate some of the core concepts of the game. And now with a little bit of luck, we've got some momentum going. And this is the first time the players see the kobolds in this adventure and potentially their gaming careers if you're bringing new folks into the hobby, which is one of my favorite things. Things to do. They're like the central antagonists of this dungeon, and the answer to who's stealing all the fish. The answer is a little more complicated than that, of course, as any good mystery should be. And the first time we find these kobolds here, they are busy trying to open a locked door. This is another gem to learn from. It's not just four kobolds in a room. They are doing something. They have a reason for being there, a goal. They aren't just standing around waiting for some heroes to come through the door and and kill them. A lot of adventures leave out details like this and feel so much flatter as a consequence. Giving the monsters motivation lets the game master run them much better, making the world feel alive and opening up way more ways for the players to interact with it. This is the first encounter in here with monsters that are actually capable of language, so negotiation in all of its forms is now on the table. Granted, this will most likely be a fight to the death, but it's all about giving the players choices and if combat does break out it's an opportunity to host a clinic on flanking tactics these kobolds are going to operate in pairs to get characters flat-footed so they can get bonus damage from their sneak attack maybe you took it a little easy with the, the animals and the undead in here but now we've got intelligent enemies who are using tactics and that should feel different and exciting another tactic intelligent enemies can use is running away instead of getting killed Pretty advanced strategy, I know, but I bet the players won't be expecting it. And Pathfinder Kobolds are built for this with their hurried retreat ability. That last Kobold standing could actually do this on their turn and stride and stride again and could end up all the way in room 11 potentially, closing that door in room 8 behind them as they go. This could explain why that door is closed and why they're in there setting up traps in room 11 when the players get there. It also gives the players another choice. Do they give chase or do they take the victory and examine the locked cage? There's some good stuff in there, including a plus one sword, but they're going to need thieves tools to get in there unless somebody like aces an athletics check. If no one has thieves tools or they break them in the attempt to open this thing, it may be worth pointing out to the players that they can head back to town to buy some and get back down here in like an hour or two. Maybe they want to pick up a healing potion or two from the crow's casks or rin's wonders while they're at it. Or maybe they just press on after these kobolds. Man, I love kobolds. They are one of the weakest intelligent monsters in the book, yet in their minds, they're just like one step below dragons. I love Meepo and the Sunless Citadel. I love the story of Tucker's kobolds, and maybe we'll do a video on that one day. I made kobolds the focus of at least the top of my Dungeon 23 mega dungeon, which got derailed by the existential crisis of the OGL wars, but became a pretty awesome one-shop that I shared on Patreon. The Throne of Upper Gnomeborough was built as a system-neutral adventure, and we had a blast during the playtest. Become a member on Patreon to get your hands on that and a bunch of other great stuff and even without signing up for anything you can check out the first look of our game master's compendium of explosive creation 
whatever you are playing, this book is going through the most used character archetypes and maybe some more creative ones to make the process of creating deeply developed, dynamic characters fast and fun. Drop a fistful of dice on the page and you've got yourself a full-fledged backstory with connections to NPCs and factions, and game masters will find tools to take those characters and connect them to the world of their adventure, with a ton of ideas for monsters and magic items and plot hooks galore. Find me at r.doyle on Patreon and all over the place for more about that and all things tabletop role-playing games. All right, on to room eight, a simple hallway. Too simple, of course, as it contains a trap. The book says have the players each roll a perception check instead of rolling it secretly for them here, and game master's choice, but people like rolling dice. And I like putting the character's fate in the player's hands as often as possible. Don't worry, even if someone gets crit by this falling ceiling and drops to zero, no one will likely die, as nothing else is going on at the moment so they can heal up. Room nine is a great puzzle, and another potential lore drop as well as we're getting the Shrine of Abadar, the god of cities and law, merchants, wealth, whose temples double as bank vaults. Now, a player might ask, like, what do I have to roll to solve this one? But be sure to hold the line. Most challenges test the character sheet, and so few test the actual player. So be ready to repeat all the pertinent information and watch the players, like, try to figure this out on their own. They don't need to solve this to advance the narrative, and if they do crack it, then the door to 10 opens, and they get some sweet, sweet treasure, plus the ability to spy a bit on room 11 and set that trap for the kobolds waiting there. Creating ways for clever players to get information and gain advantages in a fight is is always great, but not always easy. So this is a great example to learn from. The kobolds in the old throne room are ready for a fight, which extra makes sense if a kobold from seven retreated to here and alerted them. That could mean there's a third warrior in here, but remember the players don't know how many the book says were in here to begin with. And if these are living, breathing, intelligent creatures, maybe they, you know, would change what room they stand around in once in a while. You can drive yourself crazy worrying about dungeon ecologies. Who is eating what? Where does the poop go? It's some people's favorite pastime. You don't need to figure out every little thing, though. You just need to be like a step or two ahead of the players. That's really the secret of all games like this. I like having the occasional monster at least attempt to get away, not only because it makes things feel more real for the players and shows them that these things would rather not just die at their hands and that maybe some diplomacy or intimidation is an option, but can also explain why the monsters in future rooms are on their guard. Whether they used that central spear trap to their advantage or left it disabled or shot themselves in the back with it when they were done in room 11, they will have the means to head on down deeper into danger and the trap master's uh, eggshell necklace representing a big clue about what's really going on here. Maybe they get smart and bring it to town for answers or maybe they figure it out themselves. There's also a chance they end up with one of those spike traps. Maybe they dropped the trap master before they got the last one off or maybe they tried to save an armed one and even though the book says they're not reusable, that doesn't exactly make sense to me and somebody rolls crazy well to disarm it. Things happen. So you should know that Spike Snare is the official item in the core rulebook and the archives of Nethys. Now, if you have players who are experienced with this kind of game, or honestly gaming in general, they probably understand that they are standing on the edge of a new level, and that implies things might get a little bit harder. But it's still probably a good idea to make sure that message is explicit and not just implicit, as room 12 can be a doozy. This is a good time to treat wounds, maybe even visit town and resupply, especially if they got paid out from the cage in 7 and that vault in 11. Nothing needs to change down here while the characters are gone, and if you want this campaign to go for the long haul, you actually want them to spend some time topside in Otari so you can plant those seeds that we talked about at the start of this series. Whether they go down right away or later, make sure the players understand that the Cobalt Scouts in Room 12 are a tier above the Warriors they have been seeing. They have more HP and AC and they are hitting harder, plus they might ambush the PCs and then take cover behind that barricade, pushing their AC up to a very respectable 20. They are tough. When I ran this for only two players, they died in this room twice. If you if you think I'm crazy for running only two players, you might be right, but check out this video anyway after you're done with this one, of course, because 
I'm crazy like a fox. The first time they traded treasure for their lives. The second time the kobolds didn't fall for that again and the player characters woke up in the darkness having been stripped of all of their useful gear. But thanks to hit points coming from their class and their ancestry, level 1 Pathfinder characters are a bit less fragile than level 1 D&D characters. And if they do drop to zero, the odds are in favor of them surviving as long as they aren't already wounded. So if all the characters get dropped, don't panic, and know that you still have options. Even if they fail all of their death saves, you could still have them awaken in one of the shrines who knows how long later, and now they have a special connection and a sizable debt to one of these deities. How deadly you want your game comes down to taste and is worth talking to your players about, probably in session zero. The way I like things on either side of the screen is to have PC death be possible, because if it's not a ton of dramatic tension and the reasons to be strategic all go out the window. My players, who pretty much got TPK'd and lost literally everything, spent a month of downtime working in Otari to earn enough gold to outfit themselves again so they could head back down to this dungeon. And in the process, they learned a lot, established relationships in town that are still paying off many sessions later. And when they discovered their stolen goods in the chest in room 17, victory was that much sweeter. But first, my players, and now your players, have to get through room 16. The mermaid fountain is a complex trap, and they're going to deal with it inside initiative order. And it's good to understand initiative as like not only how we do combat, but a way to zoom in on time, kind of like slow motion bullet time, where the game becomes much more turn-based and less freeform. I'll call for initiative, or just stay in a initiative order when it suits the gameplay, and I'll let people know it doesn't necessarily mean a monster's like going to pop out at them. I've also started leaning into a more turn-based approach to that exploration side of things because it helps ensure all the players are getting roughly equal spotlight time and they can always just like help or pass if they don't have much to add to that. The mechanisms in the corners of this fountain have hardness, which acts in the same way the skeleton guard's resistance did back in room 5. This means they have to do nine points of damage for one to register, and that's only if they meet or beat that tough AC. Hope somebody trained in thievery. Now, I suggest you think about rolling that d10 to determine the target in front of your game master screen, or making the roll public if you're playing online, so the players can feel the tension of like that head spinning around and hoping it's not gonna point at them when the jet of water comes out. <laughs> I do all of my rolling in the open, and I love it, but it's not for everybody. Let me know in the comments if you'd want like a d deep dive on the costs and benefits of ditching the GM screen. That could be a fun video to make for sure. But in the meantime, know it's something you can do at least once in a while at dramatic moments for great effect. I'm not too worried about things going sideways in room 16. They certainly might, but this fountain isn't chasing after the PC, so they can do some hit and run or just hide out in 12 until it dries up and stops power washing this room. This might actually be the main way parties end up going through that stinky barrier because both groups I ran skipped those three rooms of the dungeon. We talked about this the last time, but remember, it is okay to prepare things that don't end up getting used. It's part of running the game. I think this temple of elemental chaos is great, and I really want to run a cinder rat, so one day my players might find this room somewhere else, maybe with more cinder rats since they'll be a higher level. Beyond the XP they get from 14 and the troglodytes, I'm sorry, Zulgans in 15, representing the difference between being level 1 or level 2 when they face the very end of this adventure, there are also some boons to be had from those elemental orbs and a chance to spy on the kobolds in 17. Now, the passage to the Underdark, I'm sorry, the Dark Lands, is something we saw in Sun of Citadel as well, and I understand why it's here, but it's really not my favorite thing, especially for first time game masters. At least here, we're getting advice that you can tell the players they wander deeper and deeper into darkness for an hour or two, and they get the sense they're going to be outclassed and heading away from their objectives. You could throw another batch of Zulgoths at them, this time with like a boss from page 80 to drive the point home if they keep on pushing. You could also say there is no passageway there or it's a dead end, this is your world, do whatever you want. But something you should know though, especially if you're taking my advice and are considering running the excellent Abomination Vault after this, then down on the third floor of Gauntlight Keep, there is a tunnel labeled C2 which can come out here. And even if the players do skip this side now, only to return here weeks or months later, that could be a pretty awesome moment, at least 
I'm looking forward to it at my table. Okay, on to room 17 and the home stretch. Room 17 is a masterclass in dungeon design. Outside of beginner adventures, creators will usually go for a less is more kind of approach so you can find the information you're looking for in the heat of the moment while running the game. And so they leave the Game Master to like figure out a lot of things that just get spelled out for us here. We know what the kobolds are doing if they aren't alerted that some armed maniacs are about to burst through their door. We know their tactics and what kinds of things they'll say during a fight. We know what it would take for one of them to surrender, what knowledge they have to share, what it takes to get it. I love this. I also love the unconventional tactics here. We talked about this a few times when I was like pumping out all those unusual magic items before, but monsters can use items too, and environmental features, maybe inspiring the players to think more creatively in the process. These aren't quite lair actions, but it makes sense that if you're fighting something where it lives, they might have some tricks up their sleeves and home field advantage. It's worth noting that it could get crowded in here as well, and if your players seem ready to move beyond like the basics, this could be a good place to introduce actions like tumble through and shove especially since shove might come up in room 18. A kobold scout has a zero in athletics, so if they use an attack to try to push one of our heroes into the pit here, it's a straight roll against the character's fortitude DC, which is 10 plus their fortitude modifier. If the character fails, they can still use the grab and edge action reaction to avoid the damage, and if the kobold critically fails, it might be them going into the pit instead. Something else this adventure does for us, which you're probably going to have to do for yourself from here on out, is to map out what Zolgran, with all her options and spells, is doing round by round. This is always good practice for any caster, and doubly important in a boss fight situation. Sometimes if I'm like transcribing a stat block out, I'll leave stuff off of it, like ghost sound detect magic, and I will list out round one, round two, round three. You can always change up in the heart of the moment, but especially if this combat is coming at the end of a session, at least for me, <laughs> it's better to have like already made all the strategic decisions. There is one little oversight, I think, here. The description says Zoltran has a big crown made out of fish bones, but that's not listed in her items or the treasure section, and you better believe some player might want that for their character. In both groups I ran, the goblin took it, and that just felt right. So at this point, there's a chance the PCs claim victory, call it an adventure. And if that happens, level them up and have Tamley talk about how those kobolds must have been feeding something pretty big, the amount of fish they were taking, but if the players aren't interested in exploring more, that is okay. Look, I know you want to unleash this dragon on them, and might feel disappointed if you don't get the chance to. I want you to run the dragon, I do. So listen, we said it last video, we said it earlier in this one, it's worth repeating, no Game Master prep gets wasted. If they don't face this dragon today, guess what? Now you've got a dragon in your back pocket, baby. It's going to get hungry and take the tunnel to the surface eventually, right? Maybe it swoops out of the sky at them in a few weeks time, angry at the heroes who killed the kobolds who were feeding it so well. Maybe it's more than a few weeks and the PCs have leveled up so much that you want the dragon to have also leveled up. Every loose thread and unclosed loop is an opportunity to make the world feel real and dynamic, to show the players that what these characters do actually matters and makes a difference. Don't get sad when they don't complete everything. Make a note and think about the consequences. This goes both ways. So if they do kill a dragon, make sure all the NPCs are impressed and they gain a reputation around Otari. If they do fight the dragon, awesome. The book says it only catches one character in its breath weapon, and that's because Anyone in that cone is likely dropping to zero at level one or level two. That extra attack in the Draconic Frenzy is also no joke, though it still incurs the attack penalty. That claw is still getting a plus six at the end. Also, don't forget it can tail attack as an attack of opportunity and has a reach of 10 feet with it. Dragons are tough. And while I'm a big believer in making the game your own and every table is different, please don't nerf dragons. They should be pretty much the scariest thing in the game, even the baby ones. The PCs can always run away from this fight and the dragon won't chase them beyond this room. It is also possible, likely in my book, that this dragon is smart enough to run away as well if it thinks it's going to die in here. Now, does that happen when it has 40 HP left or 10? That's up to you to decide in the moment what's going to be the most dramatic and satisfying conclusion to this adventure. Obviously, the players are going to feel great 
if they kill a dragon. But if it almost kills them and they just barely manage to chase it off and get all of its treasure, I bet they feel pretty awesome about it too. And now once again, you've got a dragon in your back pocket to bring out on a rainy day. However this one ends, I bet you and your players are going to be eager for next game night, especially since you have an adventure under your belt now and are feeling way more confident about running Pathfinder. And their characters just got a bunch of gold to spend and magic items to use and have leveled up and gained new abilities. There's some really solid advice about creating your own adventures and some monster sap blocks to use in that over the rest of the Game Master's Guide, which is totally worth reading, but you can also look to other great adventures published by Paizo. We started this series by talking about what I think are the best two options coming out of Menace Under Otari, so circle back to that first video in this playlist if you want to hear about that, or maybe check out this one instead. If you found this series helpful, please let me know in the comments, consider hitting like and subscribe. There is more great stuff on the way. I hope I see you there. Until then, be kind and have fun.